Hey, folks, today's episode is sponsored by Squarespace. Whether you need a portfolio to showcase your work, a store to sell your products and services, or a blog to share your ideas, Squarespace gives you everything you need to make your next move into a reality. Not to mention with Squarespace's beautifully designed templates and customizable features, creating a beautiful website is a simple and intuitive process. Start your free trial today at squarespace.com and enter offer code WTF to get 10% off your first purchase we're also sponsored by maria bamford old baby on netflix if you're looking for comedy that's a little off the beaten path this is more like a several mile detour maria's new netflix original comedy special is your remedy from the mundane you heard maria on monday show so you know i love her but now check out what she can do in front of crowds at park benches living rooms bowling alleys and la theaters in this roving comedy special savagely upbeat lovably awkward and full of surprises take a wildly funny trip through a -a one-of-a-kind comic mind watch maria bamford old baby now streaming only on netflix all right let's do the show (laughs) okay let's do this how are you what the fuckers what the fuck buddies what the fucking ears what the fucksters what's happening I am Mark Marin. This is WTF, my podcast. Maybe you can tell by the slight audio difference than what it usually sounds like that I am not at home. I am in New York City. I am directly across from Central Park. I can look out the window and see horses and people and joggers and bikers. And it's beautiful here in New York looking over Central Park. Just to the left, there's some trump owned property that i went down to the restaurant and i sat there and they said you want to look out the window at the door to uh the trump park or whatever it is and i said i don't know i think i see enough of that name everywhere else in reality when i look at anything that maybe i'll look towards the lobby that's new york city kevin bacon is on the show today that's exciting i always wanted you know kevin bacon's one of those cats you know it's like there's always been a kevin bacon you know, not the the game aside, you know, it's just like throughout my whole life, he's, uh, I, we're about the same age, but he's just always, Kevin Bacon's always just right over there. Where's Kevin Bacon? Oh, he's around. And he's just always been part of my life, you know, as a as a personality, as an actor. And it was, uh, it was interesting to talk to him because he's a solid dude. He's a solid actor. He's always fucking good. And it was exciting to have the opportunity to talk to him. New York City is fucking beautiful. I'm happy to be here. I haven't been here in a while, but it has been very busy. I'll tell you why I'm here. Because we're doing what they call in the uh, in the racket. I am here doing a bona fide press junket for the uh, upcoming Netflix show. Glow, the gorgeous ladies of wrestling. I'm I'm here with um, Betty Gilpin and uh, Allison Brie. And basically what a junk it is, and I'll be honest with you, this is the first time I've ever done this. I'm very proud of the show. It looks great. It's original. It's interesting. It's funny. It's uh, it's deep. It's a, a world that you haven't seen before. And it's exciting. It's exciting to be part of it. I Obviously, I acted on my own series for four years, but that got little to no attention and certainly not a press junket. So this is my first time doing this. It's where they... Netflix has flown us out here. They put us up at a hotel I usually don't stay at. It's fancy. And yesterday, you get up in the morning, and the three of us go to another location, another suite, and another hotel. And we sit there in front of a camera crew. And every four minutes, someone from a different local or national network outlet comes in and interviews us with slightly different uh, approaches to interview. Four and a half to seven minutes for three hours. And, you know, you get a groove going, and we've got a good chemistry, me and the ladies. And that was fun and interesting. Then you eat an okay lunch. And then you go do a series of roundtables for print interviews for the next three or four hours. And then you do a little social networking platform stuff for Netflix. And then I come back to the room. And then the the ladies go do some other stuff because it's their show. It's the ladies' show. I'm just the guy on board. I'm the uh, I'm the one guy in the world of women of glow, but uh, it was great seeing um, people do the thing. You know, we all kind of have to do the thing in show business. You know, do the interview, turn on the juice. You know, sell the uh, the show. 
Uh, and just to watch it evolve over time, it's, it's pretty amazing. There's, the, you know, there is professionalism. You know, whatever you think of whatever we do, and I certainly am not at the level of, uh, of Allison in terms of acting or anything, but, but the, you know, the job of being in show business when you are working is pretty intense and it's beautiful to watch professionals do it. You know, there's a camaraderie here. We're in the same, we're in the same game and some people are great at it and some people are okay at it. But, but, you know, showing up for this stuff is, is pretty fucking exciting and it was really fun to watch them, you know, do it as well. Is it okay if I have a good time uh, in these end times? Is it okay if I have a good day, an exciting day, even though I'm still feeling a little under the weather? I hope this isn't the end of me. That's it. You know, I, I don't like being this age where, you know, you get a little buggy and then you're like, ah, oh, is this it? Is this the harbinger of the end of me? Look, I know I already mentioned to you that we're sponsored today by Squarespace, but let me make, let me, let me take a minute to tell you why Squarespace can help you out no matter what your next move is. No matter what you're doing, you need a website, right? You need a website that looks good on mobile devices, and you need a website that you can update quickly and easily even when you're not an expert. That's why Squarespace is great. They give you everything you need so you can be an expert right from the start. Whether you're making a versatile online store or a simple blog, you even get a unique domain so you can make sure your website represents you 100%. With Squarespace's award-winning templates, creating a beautiful website is a simple and intuitive process. You can add and arrange your content and features just by dragging and clicking. There's nothing to install, patch, or upgrade ever. And if you ever have a question, Squarespace's award-winning 24-7 customer support can help you with any problem, no matter what it is. They're like your own IT department. So make your next move and start your free trial today at squarespace.com. Enter offer code WTF to get 10% off your first purchase. And if you purchase an annual plan, you'll get a free domain. That's squarespace.com, offer code WTF. Spent some time with my pal, Sam Lipsight, had a little dinner. It, you know, it's wild when you, you don't see friends as often as you probably should see friends. And something I've learned from, uh, from, doing, uh, from doing the podcast for so long is a lot of times you, you got to catch up. And a lot of times that, that seems like a, a very stilted process and, and it seems somewhat, uh, you know, uh, forced. So it's funny what me and Sam is that like when, when I see him, I'm like, you know, do you have a few hours? Cause we're going to have to sit and do it. Cause you know, they, I haven't talked to him in months. So, you know, he's had his life going on. I got my life going on. He's got his problems. I got my problems. He's got his successes. I got my successes. So when we go out, you know, we meet. Took a train and you start the conversation. We get to dinner. You continue the conversation, but not unlike a podcast, sometimes it takes a while to to break through to the uh, the the engagement and the relaxation and the just hanging out part. And uh, it's it's always sort of beautiful. There's an arc to it. It, it ends up if it starts off a little like uh, God things, ooh, eh. and then you know you have dinner and you get some laughs going. You get a little you know uh, you know some some. Uh, thoughts going and you know, some ideas going just in conversation and then you kind of then we took a like a nice long 20 30 block walk and kind of eased into a, 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 a the friendship part and then just you know spending time together and talking it through but over the three or four hours you know it, it all came together that you know there's no editing with that you know you can't uh you, you can't go back and cut things or add things but uh but sometimes to really connect with somebody take some time and, you know, and, and, uh, you know, you hang in there and, and you wait for it to happen if the relationship is important to you. It's just something you gotta, you gotta do. You gotta do. And it doesn't get any easier the longer time you spend, uh, not talking to somebody. So stay in touch with the people you love, if possible. And, you know, have those nice long conversations. That's another little public service announcement from me. Cause it's worth it. It's worth it. Those things are important. You know, life goes by. You know, things seem daunting. Everything gets filled up. You get busy. You get distracted. All of a sudden, your time is being eaten by uh, any number of things. Make sure you take time to really get in and connect with the people that are important. That's what makes life good. There are things that make it good. It's not just like, oh, I got to, and then I'm going to, and then like, oh, my God, what happened? Is this going to, why, I got to be the, the, the thing, and I don't know if I can do that. Oh, what's what's on for later today? Where do I got to be tomorrow? Why is that person calling me? Yeah, shut it down. Take some time. Connect with some friends. 
Today's Thursday, so tomorrow I'm going to be in Philly. I think there's a few tickets for the Philly show. It's tomorrow night, May 12th, at the Miriam Theater. I think there might be a few tickets for that. That's my second to my last date of this tour, um, which may be the final tour for a while. And then on uh, Saturday, May 13th, I'm going to be down at the Warner Theater in the heart of the beast, Washington, D.C. I wonder how that place feels now that you know things are, are shifting. But I believe that show is pretty close to selling out at the Warner Theater. If you want tickets uh, for either of these shows, you can go to WTFPod.com slash tour and... Um, Go. There's direct links for you there to go to the place that has the tickets. And on June 3rd, the next live appearance is BookCon. Uh, also, there's a, a link for that at uh, WTFPod.com slash tour. That's uh, me and Brendan, Brendan McDonald, my uh, producer and uh, business partner, are going to be down there doing a thing for the book, waiting for the punch, which is very exciting. The more I think about that book, the more excited I am for you guys to get your hands on it. You can pre-order it. You can get that uh, link, too, I believe, at the website under book. <laughs> it's a very clever. Waiting for the punch. Yeah, you can pre-order the book. And I'll tell you, man, it's like it's so wild to read what people say. And it, it's just one of those books that you can pick up anywhere, uh, you know, and just get into, you know, open it up anywhere and uh, kind of engage with it. Sort of like conversation. But uh, very proud of it and very excited to uh, to get it into your hands. So what else is happening next week? I'm going to I'm going to be shooting another episode of Joe Swanberg's Easy in Chicago. And then I think finally I get to uh, to relax as much as possible in the current uh, world that we live in. Uh, it's been a long run between the tour of the podcast um, glow, the, uh, you know, shooting the special, everything else. I, I really learned, I got to I got to stop for a minute. I'm not going to stop doing this, but I, I've got to figure out how to take a breath because my body is and my mind are wearing down. I'm certainly not complaining. I'm uh, excited to be busy, but uh, but uh, you know I got to you know I feel beat up, folks. I feel beat up. Kind of a funny thing happened on the plane. I ran into somebody on the plane, and I you know I think I I should probably tell you about it, but let me just do this first <laughs> because I you know it was one of those things that uh, I always wonder about. And it was sort of confirmed. <laughs> well, in this specific situation. All right, one second. We're sponsored today by Audible, presenting Ponzi Supernova. Ponzi Supernova is a six-part Audible original series that sheds new light on Bernie Madoff and the biggest Ponzi scheme in history. This original audio documentary series tells the story you think you know. Bernie Madoff, legendary fraudster, is sent to prison for orchestrating the largest Ponzi scheme in history, but that's definitely not the full story. It's drawn from hours of unheard conversations with Bernie Madoff behind bars and interviews with the SEC the FBI, and the victims of his scheme. Ponzi Supernova takes you on a fascinating journey into the dark interior of our financial system. Follow journalist Steve Fishman as he chases the real story and talks to Madoff himself. If you love great documentaries, you're going to love this. You can now listen to Ponzi Supernova for free on Audible or wherever you get podcasts. I did not talk to uh, Kevin Bacon about Bernie Madoff. FYI. So go listen to the thing on Audible. So I'm on the plane and I'm I'm about to sit down in my seat. I'm coming from LA to New York and who gets on the plane? Werner Herzog. Now I thought I had a pretty good conversation with Werner Herzog and a lot of times when I talk to people, uh, even though it's for a nice long time, whatever my emotional connection in that hour or hour and a half or however long I spend with them is uniquely mine. It does not necessarily mean it's theirs or anything else. And a lot of times I run into him. I don't have any real expectations. I don't assume that we're friends. Some people I know and I see and I think I could be friends with, but generally I don't, I don't socialize with people I meet on the podcast. But you know, Werner Herzog, that was a big deal. That was a big day. And, uh, you know, I, I, I felt like I, I had some familiarity with the guy that I could at least, you know, say hello. So, you know, he's getting on behind me and I'm about to sit down and I go, uh, uh, Mr. Herzog, how, how are you? And he looked at me like he had no fucking idea who I was at all. But, you know, I think that's the way he looks. And I go, it's, it's me, Mark. You know, we talked in my garage. He's like, oh, yes, yes. Uh, okay. You know, and, and I'm like, uh, okay. Yeah. He's like, hi. And, and he just literally gave not a fuck, not one fuck. 
And, you know, I wasn't hurt. I, I wasn't surprised. I'd, I'd actually be surprised if, if, if Werner Herzog didn't do that. But there was part of me that I'm like, God, does he even remember that we talked? Is it, you know, and oh my God. And then it was just, it was, it was kind of funny. I, I found it funny. I was not insulted. I, I was sort of uh, happy that that's the way he responded. And, uh, you know, and then I thought like, you know, okay, so he's sitting a couple of seats behind me. There's Werner Herzog. Uh, you know, I, I, what if the plane goes down? Would he be narrating it in his mind? The plane is crashing. They're screaming all around me. Smoke is filling the cabin. I realize now I know the man who said hello to me. It is of no consequence now. I do a terrible Werner Herzog, and I'm not good at impressions, but uh, I thought it was a good idea. I thought it was a funny idea. That maybe he would remember me in that flat presentation. I'm not going to explain the fucking joke, folks. So... Kevin Bacon uh, is on the show. He's in this new series called I Love Dick, which I watched like three or four of, and I thought were it was, again, not unlike uh, a lot of shows now. It's like a completely surprising world that you would never know about, or it's hard to believe it even exists, but it's kind of an interesting show. Catherine Hahn is fucking genius in it. Griffin Dunn, also great, and uh, Kevin is great. Uh, it's, it's produced, executive produced by Jill Soloway. Uh, it premieres tomorrow, Friday, May 12th. Uh, again, on Amazon. It's an Amazon series. And this is, um, this is me and Kevin Bacon back in the garage. So what, how's it going? It's going pretty well. Yeah. You don't live out here though. Uh, I finally, uh, a few years ago broke down and got a little place out here. You did? Yeah. Um, so. My wife and I were kind of like very committed L.A. haters. You yeah, know? yeah, well, sure. Yeah. And and uh, you know, we I think so often we kind of defined ourselves with this New York kind of thing. Right. And and she grew up in New York. I grew up in Philly, but I moved to right. New York when I was a kid, when I was like seventeen. So I definitely felt more connected to that. Sure. And um, it, you know, the reason. Uh, I guess was kind of complicated, but I think part part was sort of like this um, kind of love hate thing that I yeah. had with this with with the business and uh-huh. with the city and all yeah. that kind of stuff. You know? Yeah, sure. But uh, she was on a television show for seven years, so it was for seven years straight, yeah. six months of the year, uh, some combination of the two of us was living either in a hotel or a rented house, right? And um, eventually. On the at the very last year of her show, or I guess it was eight years now. Yeah. Think about it, we stopped and said, you know, I think we're really going to miss this neighborhood. And we were living in this great um, funky house. You'd appreciate this around this, here. Yeah, yeah. And and uh, this house uh, was um, built, I think, in the um, in the twenties, and it's uh, owned by a italian rock star he's like the he's oh yeah like, he's like the bruce springsteen of italy <laughs> and he bought this house as an investment and, and rents it out but what's super cool about it is that there was an old speakeasy that was built into um no the shit. the basement of yeah, the house yeah. yeah yeah and the guy and they turned into a, a recording studio uh-huh so it's like this fantastic and you do the music yeah is it usable it's oh yeah. it's it's fantastic so we we rented that house yeah. and then moved up the street and you know, I love L.A. now. Oh I'm, no, I'm, I've completely it, turned around. It got I got you. I, I think it was. I think it had. I don't really know what it is. Growing up, or or changing my attitude, or um, appreciating uh, a different neighborhood. You know, kind of being like over on this side of town. And I, I don't know. Now, I, now I'm like, I'm, I'm crazy about it. And, and frankly, I think my wife is. Uh, kind of digging on it more than New York. I don't know if I'm quite there yet. That's one of the things, though. I mean, you might, maybe you're a sociable person, but uh, out here, one of the things, it's easy to get sort of isolated because you do have to drive. Like, everything, everything's diminished by the idea that sort of like, now oh, we've got to go to their house yes. on the west side? Yes. Oh, fuck. No, I know. <laughs> I know. That. I'm the same way. I'm the same way. I'm like, <laughs> can't we meet him halfway? Is yeah. The well, restaurant? well, a lot of times we have those negotiations with, with our friends. That oh, we yeah. Want. Yeah. We're like, let's 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 look at the map and see. You <laughs> There's got to be a restaurant somewhere between us. But the thing is, is that they always they always have it worse because they've got to they've got to get it on the other side of the 405. 
Yeah, I can't. I, I I try to avoid the West Side entirely, and I hear it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what I mean, it, I can't. I don't understand it. I don't do it. So mm. it's weird. I think we. I have this thing where a uh, connection. Like I think you and I were on a gig in D.C., but you were playing in the band with mm-hmm. your brother. I don't remember what it was for, mm. but I think I did stand up. Oh, and, yeah. and you did the. You guys closed it out, but I didn't talk to you. Okay. But like they have this weird connection i think your brother the guitar player his name is is it michael michael Mm -hmm. was a teacher at a camp i went to Hmm. lighthouse arts and music camp in pottsville pennsylvania huh is that possible like Um, like i don't think he was there when i was there because he was like their big alumni and he came back and he played like jim croce also i think taught there well i know that he had played at a camp in PA, yeah, uh, but it was called Charlestown Playhouse. So I don't know if it. I, I don't know if the lighthouse went in Pottsville, but it's, uh, it's cer- certainly possible. Well, yeah. I'll, have, I'll have to ask him. Well, yeah, I think he was actually like a teacher there. Like, no it kidding. Was, huh? Well, that that was the impression well, I got. There, I, I might have forgotten about that, but well, he, I mean, he's ten years older than me, so sometimes there's there's things in his life that I don't remember. Well, you could have been ten. You could have done it in his twenties. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So. But, so that's 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 fascinating. I'll ask him about it's that. It's weird, man, because yeah. I, I remember him coming up and playing, and uh-huh. it was like that's Kevin Bacon's brother, which has to be at some point sort of the bane of his, All right. his popularity. But he's been playing folk music forever, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He he's never done anything other than than play music, and now uh, he's a composer, uh, doing a lot of uh, movie stuff. Does huh? a lot of movie stuff uh, and a lot of documentaries, and he also is a professor now. Oh, um, so he's teaching composing and um film score and stuff like that so he's besides the band uh, he's got a whole lot of other you know he made the shift he was like i gotta make a living yeah well it's interesting you know he he, when you talk about what we do you know a lot lot of people have done um other kinds of gigs in their life you know I, i i was a you know i worked in a warehouse and then i was a bus boy and then i was a waiter you know i had a lot of sort of jobs my brother's never done anything right other than than, than playing than, guitar then make music and yeah. make a living at making music right which is really like like when i think about that that's just kind of such a an accomplishment you it's, know it's crazy life it, you know and, and i'm glad that he's he's sort of uh evolved into these other avenues with it Do you, you know what i mean because sometimes if you're just hammering away playing the music and things don't, and you don't, like I had that moment where you get to a certain point in your life and things aren't working out and you don't know how, what are you going to fucking do? Yeah, I know. It's like, you know, like I can't, what are you, am I going to re-enter the workforce at 45? Yeah. The last job I had was like, you know, I was a grill cook. Yeah. You know, sort of like, yeah, maybe a restaurant. Yeah. Uh, big gap in the resume. No, I know. It's, it's, um, it's, uh. But when did you work? As it? Uh, well, when I was, got out of high, I got out of high school, um, uh, I, I had a I had a high school where I, if I did enough kind of gathering of credits, sort of yeah. like it was, it was set up more kind of like a college. Yeah, uh, I could graduate early, so I got out half a year early, and then I was de- still down in Philly, and I was working um, packing and shipping um, medical books, and then um, it was the summer of 1976, and Philadelphia was getting excited about uh, uh, yeah having the bicentennial yeah and. I joined up with this kind of avant-garde um, theater group, <laughs> and keep in mind I was literally like 17 years old. Right, and um, they let me in, and we were going to create a sort of like a musical theater thing for this bicentennial that was going to be. A, and of course, I was really excited because right. here were these older actors, and a lot of them were, you know, beautiful uh, women. They were probably, you know. 20. Right. I thought of them as like, you know, older, you know, kind of um, established people. And uh, we would have these rehearsals where um, we would sort of like do theater games and, you know, trust exercises and, you know, pretend that you're an eggplant and all that kind of stuff. And it didn't really seem to be going anywhere. And I was simultaneously working in this in this warehouse to make some money. Uh, And I hadn't I hadn't applied to college because I really didn't want to go to college. Because I was so clear on the fact that I I wanted to be an actor, and all of a sudden, about uh, you know, a couple of months before uh, the bicentennial, yeah, uh, I, I I said I, I can't I, I quit. 
And, you quit? Yeah, I quit. I mean, it's like I, I was, a, I was just such a cocky little shit. I was like, you know, I, I, I can't. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do this. I'm gonna go, gonna go to New York. Well, what was the plan for the big performance? Was it a gorilla performance? Was I, it? Actually- no, I think it was gonna be like a show. And yeah. you know, I don't, I, I, frankly, I don't even know if it ever um, got together. But it was a pretty, you know, they were, they were definitely people who had had sort of experience with this thing before. But I just said, you know, man, I gotta get, uh, I gotta get to New York. Um, you know, I love Philly, but, but New York was like a giant magnet that was just kind of right pulling me up. That's where it happened. And so when I got there, uh, that's when I got a job as a, as a bus boy. But did you do that? When did you start doing acting? I mean, you come from a huge family, right? Uh, yeah, I'm the youngest of six, but I, I, I don't remember ever not being an actor, but even before I knew what an actor was. Right. But did you do it in high school? Did you do plays and do that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did everything I possibly could. I did everything I could. I did um, every single play. We didn't have much theater in my school, but then I would work um, on the weekends. I, I apprenticed at a theater called the uh, Manning Street Actors Theater. Yeah. And uh, I would literally sweep the stage and you know, anything I could do to hang around the, you know, right. So the was, boards. Right. Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was a community theater? Like there was always people around. It had a full, uh, yeah, you know, crew there, all the time. Sure, sure. There were a couple of community theaters um, in in Philly. Uh, Manning Street was a little bit more of a professional theater. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I obviously wasn't getting paid, but but there were people who were getting paid. Did you see uh, big shows there? Were there like were there? Did you get an opportunity to like watch? You know. The, uh, no, I didn't really go to the theater that much. I, I really didn't. <laughs> My parents didn't, didn't really take me, and. Um, <laughs> You know, I didn't really have the, yeah. the, I didn't really have the money and, and, and I would go to the movies. Sure. Um, I started going to the movies, you know, as soon as I could, you know, it was that thing where our, all the good movies were R, let's right. face it, in the seventies, sure. you yeah. know, all the, all the good stuff yeah. from Coppola and the, Ashby and, and, and uh, yeah, yeah, Scorsese the, uh, yeah. and, and De Palma. You know, De Palma. Yeah. All, it was, that was all the good stuff. And, yeah. And, um, they were all R, so like we had, we would have to, you know, either pretend to be older than we were, you know, just try to figure it out. And I was not an old looking guy, so yeah. um, that was hard. But I almost sometimes had a hard time watching movies because, especially when I was a little boy, because it was almost as though I wanted to get home and play that part. Like, I, right. it was so hard for me not to be in it. Do right. you know what I mean? Oh, right. To like look at it and not be a cowboy or not be, you know, a, whatever, an astronaut or fireman, you know. So, like, I would come home and just dress up as that thing and start pretending to be that thing. So that's what I mean. And you had an by, active fantasy life. I did. I have a very active fantasy life and I and I and I really um always wanted to be another um you know, another character. Well, is that because were you uh I have to imagine being the youngest of six kids, your parents were probably like, Ugh. And I totally. said, <laughs> Well, they had five. They had five kids, and then eight years later, I was born. So you do the math. I mean, there's right. no way they wanted to have another child. Is that a Catholic thing? No, they're not Catholic. No, no, no. Just, no, a just uh, accident. Just an accident. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, my mother kind of denied it, and I was like, oh, "Please, you come know, on." You have, and so, then she eventually came around to calling you know me a happy mis- happy accident or something like that. But, but you know, uh, but, so everyone was out of the house by the time you they were. were. 10? They were, but even when I was very, yeah, yeah, by the time I was 10, they were all gone. But even when I was really, really young, I can remember walking into a room and just wanting people to look at me yeah. and to, and figuring out some way to be um, entertaining. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, that was like a very, very strong drive. But that sort of makes sense to be in, in, in an emotional environment where they, you know, they just brought up five kids. Like you must have, on some level, felt like you know, where's mine? Where's my, where's the attention? No, no, I, I didn't. Oh, good. It was awesome. It was. Just, I, it was I, 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 I was such an independent kid. And look, I don't know if those that's like nature nurture, right? right Maybe right. they weren't giving me the attention, so I had to become that sure, person. Sure. Maybe I naturally came out that way. I don't. That I don't know. Yeah. Um, but like I, I often say that when I left home, and I'm not sure they noticed <laughs> <laughs> that I had split. On the other hand. They were incredibly supportive of me doing what I wanted to do. Nobody ever said, don't you need something to fall back on? Oh, really? Or, yeah, they, it, they were very supportive. And your dad was like, what it, was his game? What was his My game? dad was a, uh, he was a city planner of Philadelphia for many, many, many years. Oh, man. And um, he was actually uh, kind of kind of an important person because he, he, he was at the time when... Um, 
there was urban sprawl, not urban sprawl so much as a uh, white, white flight. A oh, white flight. White flight. And suburbs were becoming the place to be. Right. And they, they did, just uh, took all the blood out of the downtown. Yes. And his life's battle was to bring life back to cities. And they did it. They did it in Philly. Philly's like one of those places where I go and I'm like, this is great. Because it's got a, there's definitely a defined type. That Philly is a place. Yes. You, you know, it, it's mm-hmm. like, you know, I go there. There's a couple of sandwiches I like. I mm-hmm. know the basically the type of dudes I'm going to run into. Sure. Yeah. But, uh, but like that whole downtown area has been, you know, reborn. Sure. And your dad was sort of the beginning of that evolution. He, he was, although I, I, I think that, uh, yeah, no, he definitely was. And, and, you know, by the time he, um, it's, in some ways, some things were more successful than others, but, but, it was his it it ran through his veins and just cities in general i mean he was he was obsessed with all cities was know. he saddened that they were dying or you know because yes. because it was so vital in his you know mind? he was he was and the and the older he got um the more sort of like impassioned he got yeah yeah and he didn't get less passionate he got more impa- more passionate and more kind of like eccentric and stuff i mean i'll, I'll give you an example he Long after he retired, in fact, I think he was about ninety. Wow, he lived for a while. Yeah, huh? he lived till he was ninety four, but I think he was about ninety two yeah. or ninety. There was a park in Philly called Love Park, yeah. and it's called Love Park because it has that L O V E. Oh, the sculpture, sculpture, yeah. There, yeah, yeah, right. And it became a mecca for skateboarders. Skaters, yeah, loved it yeah. because they could grind on all these built in things, and basically. They were kind of like the only ones who were using it. Uh huh. And the city came to them and said, "You can't. You know, you're you're fucking up all the all the furniture and all the all the you know the the the, the right. everything is like be, being destroyed. So we have to kick all the skaters out of Love Park." And my father, there's no love there. There's no love there, right? <laughs> so it became illegal, okay, right. to be on a skateboard in Love Park. Yeah, he went down and. Got on a skateboard, tried to get arrested. He At ninety two, yeah, he, he, they put a they put a, um, a, a, a you know helmet on him, and had a couple of people hold him and like rolled him around on a skateboard. I think there's actual video of it. Yeah, and I don't think the cops actually arrested him, but that was his dream because he. So he actually at that age, believe it or not. I'll run into skaters that'll say, "Oh, your dad was the music, dude. Your dad was such a hero for us, man." And I think they actually have ended up having like a um, not not having anything to do with him, but I think there's actually a, a Love Park video game or something like that. Oh so, yeah, so it's like that kind of stuff, like the pre- a skateboard video game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People using spaces, public spaces, was really really important to him. So that's and so are all your sibs still around? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. did any of them, any other ones other than your brother Michael go into show business? No. Mm-mm. No, did, did they go into city work? Did they, uh, uh, but yeah, some some are in city work, and um, one is a uh, events um, planner. Another works for arts council in Vermont, and um, uh, uh, another is in you know the private sector. You know, oh, they're, they're in a whole, a whole bunch of other stuff, and and we're very you know very close. Uh, really, that's group. great. Yeah, yeah, um, we. Uh, we do the big family thing. We do. We have a giant um, Thanksgiving. Oh. We don't do Christmas, but we do a giant Thanksgiving. Well, that's nice. It's amazing. We do it at our house in in, in New York at our apartment. And everyone's got kids, so there's like fifty people there. It's Is about it? yeah. It's usually about f- between forty and fifty. Oh my yeah, god. Yeah, because my wife has a big family too. You know, she's got like a Brady Bunch kind of family. Right, so. and she's like um, deep New York. They're yeah. all around, right? Yeah, yeah. It's 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 crazy. It's 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 my favorite. It's my favorite holiday. I mean, because what's wrong with eating and giving thanks no nothing and you know sometimes once a year you see everybody it's good it's yeah, awesome. for, for most people that's like just to write them out yeah then we got that <laughs> day or two and then we're out yeah so yeah. Uh, when you started the acting because like you know it's weird that, that when you were coming over like I, my memory of you is is pretty you know entrenched like you know you're part of my cultural uh you know upbringing mm-hmm. you know kevin bacon was sort of always there mm-hmm. somehow but when you started, I mean, really young, going to New York. So did you, did you train, or were you just driven by cockiness? How did it, how did it work? I did train um, with who? I, I went to the Circle in the Square uh, Theater School first as a um, in their summer program, which was really for like um, uh, high school age kids, and then and then 
I asked them if I could audition for their winter thing. It was a two-year program. Yeah. And they said, you're too young. And I said, can I please just audition? And, and I got into that. And so I was um, going to school there, working as a waiter. At Circle in the Square. Yeah, I was going to Circle yeah. in the Square and, and, and working as a, as a, as a waiter uh, or a busboy, depending on which place I was at, by, at night. And trying to, you know, learn as much as I could and try to, and, and try to make a living. And, um. Well, from those days, like, what things did you learn then that you still use? Yeah, you know, it's funny because I was in school because I kind of felt like I needed to be in school. Yeah. But on the other hand, I also had this sort of attitude that, that there was nobody that could teach me anything. Yeah. You know, I, I was, I was so, um, such a combination of, like, confidence for absolutely no reason uh and also terrified you know my right, yeah, yeah. you know my yeah that's the that's the artist line that's the that's the edge we go on just right paralyzing fear and weird cockiness exactly it, and i feel like you need to have that kind of sure you know combination of that it's like the emperor's new clothes right you're going to be exposed right you know for for being a fraud but uh, yeah, but right. in order to not be exposed for being a fraud you got to pretend like you know what the fuck you're doing <laughs> and and i didn't while i was in school um i often felt like i don't really know why we're doing this and i don't know why this teacher is saying this and and it, it was kind of more about um me trying to do well or do better or get yeah. compliments or something like that. But the truth is, is that now, and you know, for many years, I'll go back and I'll think about something that I was taught. Oh yeah, and I'll go. They were absolutely right. Like that was like if I had just <laughs> listened to that. You know what I mean? Like, like if I left myself. A little, everyone's got their journey, right? So, yeah. You know, it doesn't really matter. It's worked out okay. But if I'd left my myself open to the fact that there were people who could teach me not just about acting but also about like the business you yeah know? like you know i had an agent um who uh you know uh just passed recently and and he was you know my first agent and you know stuck with me for years and years and years but it's like i never let him guide me in a weird sort of way did he offer yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I, I was just, no, oh, I got this. I, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this. I'm not going to do that. You know what I mean? And, and you know, really, I think that you, it's a, if I could tell, you know, uh, the younger me something, yeah. that's what I would say. It's like, dude, you know, just people know shit. Like, right. From being, having been around and seen things. Hard to trust people, though. You know, it's hard to trust people in the sense that you don't know, especially in this business, whether someone's coming at you for their own benefit or, you know, actually thinking about your best interest. But did you have a mentor or do you, did, were, were you able to look at, at other, you know, comics and say, sure. I, 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 or, or listen to their advice or. Well, I, what, what, you know, with comedy, it's a little easier. You know, you, you sort of like, what is the tone? You know, it's all you up there. So, you, you know, you're, you're, you're in a narrow context. So how are you going to use that thing? You know, who, you know, you can uh, look up to people and like people's comedy and aspire to honesty or, or one line, whatever mm -hmm. it's going to be. So it's a little more of a gypsy sort of, uh, but approach. you still have to be yourself. Well, yeah, you yeah. want. That's ultimately what I wanted to get at. Mm. But, you know, in terms of business, I didn't understand show business till a few years ago. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm in my garage, dude. <laughs> like, you know, I was a stubborn asshole and I yeah. never, I never understood that, you know, maybe it's good to be diplomatic and uh, acknowledge that, you know, that assistant's going to be the king of Hollywood at some point, uh, that people hold grudges mm. and that, you know, you can fuck yourself real easy. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just by being cocky. Mm -hmm. I learned that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, fortunately, I landed on my feet somewhat. Sure did. But uh, I don't know. It, I believe that people who act, there's a, a lot of natural talent there. I mean, either you can do it or you can't on some level. I mean, like, there, there's a lot that you can't explain, right? Um, yeah. I mean, I think I think that's true. I think that's true. But I also think you can get better. I mean, when I look at... Um, which I really don't because it makes me so nuts. It but, does? Yeah, to look at early work. I mean, I, there's, you know, I just go, oh, fuck. Well, how'd the first role come? I mean, I, you know, I, I remember you for, as, what was it, Fenwick? 
I remember Fenwick. Animal House was the first movie that I ever did. Right. And it, wa- it wasn't my first role because I was very, very into uh, theater. And I, 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 uh, although I ended up on soap operas, but that was actually after Animal House. What kind of theater were you doing? Like, a oh, live- I did an all off Broadway regional theater. Um, Weird shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking about the other day about um, research. You know how you you throw yourself. Out. I was talking to John Lithgow in a, in a in an interview about the research that both of us had done to to do those parts in Footloose. I was thinking about a play that I did called Forty Deuce, which was probably back in the late 70s. I was playing a um, male prostitute um, drug dealer. In those days, they called him a chicken. Yeah. And and, uh, there was a bar and an area in Times Square where these young boys would get off the, off the, um, the bus and go, and they would meet these Johns at this, at this bar. The terminal bar. It was actually called, uh, I think it was called the Haymarket. Yeah. Um, and I spent like a lot of time being that guy. Now I'd never turned a trick. Right. But when I think back on that, first off, I was able to do that kind of research. And what, were you like 20? No, 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 no. Like 18. Uh huh. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I get like 18 or 19, I would think. Then there was 53rd Street where at night these guys would cruise and, um, I would go down there and, and, and walk around and, and, you know, like <laughs> it was, so interesting to be in a situation where nobody knows who you are. Yeah. Obviously. It's something that I couldn't really do now. Right. And um and to just look at a different side of life that's not your experience. And it's a little menacing. It, looks... it was menacing, oh yeah. It definitely was. It definitely was. So you're out there like presenting yourself as meat. Yes. For... <laughs> and yeah. you're getting all yeah. that weird juice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 But um, those experiences were, uh, incredibly, uh, uh, rich and, 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 and helpful too, you know, in terms of just playing the part. It did, it did help. Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. So that's the kind of theater, uh, to answer your question that, that I was doing down and dirty and very, very, uh, kind of strong character kind of, kinds of parts. You but know? you took it on yourself to, to like research was, is an important part of your trip. Yeah. F- yeah. You yeah. know, in, in order to build the guy. Yeah. 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 And that sticks. That still happens. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then, and then you go, well, what good did it actually do? And you don't really know. It's very hard to look at the performance and go, Oh, I got that from doing that. Sure. You know, uh, what I was talking to, um, uh, John Lithgow about was, was when, <laughs> when I got the part in Footloose, I was, I was, uh, 23, I think, or 24. Yeah. And I was supposed to be playing a 17 year old high school student. Yeah. And I was afraid that I wasn't, I was like, how can anybody think of me as a 17 year old? So I checked myself into the high school yeah. in Utah where we were shooting uh-huh. as a student that had just moved to town. So basically, with the help of the high school principal and the guidance counselor, I was able to create for a day that experience that the character in the movie was going through. Now, none of the students knew and none of the teachers knew. Yeah. And that was. For instance, like very, very informative. How they me. treat you? Yeah, well, they treat me like shit. I mean, the thing is, is that <laughs> here's the thing: is that I had this idea that if I'm from a big city, yeah, right, and streetwise or whatever, if I go to a small town, yeah, I'm gonna be a badass. Like I'm not gonna, you know, these these you gotta make your mark. Yeah, like yeah. these, you know, uh, you know, farm boys are cow pokes. Gonna, yeah, they're yeah. yeah, they're not gonna, you know. The second I got there, I was like, oh, shit, I am so out of my element. And it was very much like the movie. People making fun of me, making fun of what I wore. In one day? Of, of my ha- In one day. My hair, girls giggling, one guy coming up to me, taking me under his wing, um, showing me the ropes. Yeah. Uh, teachers not being very nice to me. I mean, like, it was like a... It was amazing, like microcosm of what of what right. that movie was. And it's also, about. I guess, amazing how well written the thing was because it nailed it, right? It did. It <laughs> did. Although I have to say, I did change a few things um, based on on that experience. Not much, but I mean, just little kind of details. But uh, oh yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, this is funny. I I, I just this just popped into my head. I'll give you an example. Yeah, is that <laughs> this is during the time of that look you probably know where you had skinny ties and it was like man new wave work, a new wave yeah, right yeah. new wave it was yeah. kind of and i was a really big um police fan and yeah yeah and, sure you know uh that whole thing and in the script originally 
it's the mother says to me, shouldn't you wear a tie and a jacket if you're going to the first day of school? And I say, Mom, I'm not going to wear a tie. And what I realize is that a tie, a skinny tie, was going to be way weirder than than what she was suggesting. Yeah. So we switched it around. So yeah. I'm putting a tie on. Yeah. And she's like, are you really going to wear that tie? And when I show up at this school, the guys are in jeans and, you sure. know, like... High you school. Know, yeah. 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 And plaid shirts and 70s, stuff. Yeah. yeah. And here I am with a like a kind of a jacket and a, and a green right. tie. And it's like, I'm way more out of, you know... Out. I remember when that happened in high school. Because right. I'm like, I'm 53. So I was... I was in high school when the new wave thing took hold. Mm-hmm. Everybody started wearing buttons, right. thin ties, yeah, the sure. knack, my Sharona. Yeah, there you go. That's what turned uh, it, I think. Uh, uh, that's right. Well, that's wild, man. But wait, let's go back, because Animal House is pretty important. Well, he came. they sent the casting director to the school, Yeah, and I didn't have an agent. To the circle rep? To circle in the square, circle yeah. Circle in the square, yeah. yeah. And the casting director said to the school, do you have any kids that might work as like a preppy uh, um, college freshman. Yeah. An asshole. An asshole. Yeah, yeah. Who, yeah. <laughs> preppy asshole. Who's your, who's your preppy? Who's your best? Do you have a preppy asshole here? They're like, yeah. yes, we do. <laughs> um, <laughs> step, well, step right this way. Yeah. So they sent me over and I had this meeting basically with the casting director. There was really very little for me to read. I mean, I, I, I don't know if I had a lot of lines. Right. I mean, I did have a couple lines, but not a lot. And then um, they sent me back to meet with uh, John Landis, who was the director. And he said, "I want you to make us make us make a face like you're smarmy, smarmy. I want to I want to see if you're smarmy." <laughs> and I, I I literally had no idea what smarmy <laughs> meant, but it's kind of an onomatopoeia. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So I just kind of went, you know, yeah. it, and it's sorry, it's radio. Yeah, I made a face. Yeah. And uh, he was like, "Yeah, yeah, that's it. I love that." You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and so then uh, I got a call back, and then the 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 guy just called me up and said, y- "You gotta uh, get on a plane, like like you know, in a couple of weeks." And and that face came in useful. I remember that face. It was horrible. Yeah, and that- <laughs> just absolutely awful. Yeah. yeah, but yes, it did come in. Like that that one note, it kind of informed that whole character. It did. <laughs> It absolutely did. It absolutely did. And then, in you know, speaking of kind of research, what was interesting about the Animal House situation yeah. was that, first off, I mean, talk about an amazing kind of like, oh my God, here I am, I'm in a movie, this is so fucking cool. Right. I yeah, mean, yeah, I yeah. flew to Oregon and, and I'd never been, I'd hardly ever been on a plane, but I'd definitely never been in first class. Yeah, right. Um, and everything about it was just like, crazy crazy cool yeah um but landis kind of created a situation i think on purpose where he didn't he wanted to bring the animal house the cool guys right out early and have them sort of bond which yeah. they did yeah they went to a frat party they got into fist fights you know they got drunk they you know they had a, like a really bonding thing and wanted to kind of separate the rest of us the losers you know, the assholes yeah. from the cool people. And what actually happened was that actually happened. <laughs> and they really wouldn't hang out with me. Yeah. And that was a difficult for me. Like I, Belushi and Matson and You know, John was in a different kind of category, honestly, because he was flying back and forth for Saturday oh, yeah, Night right, Live. Right. And he had a house and he wasn't staying in the same hotel as the rest of us. Yeah. You know. But everybody else I'll tell you, this is an absolute true story. It's funny. Uh, <laughs> I was um, seeing this uh, waitress at the at the hotel. Yeah, and these guys would have parties all the time in, right. one, in one of the guys' rooms. The cool guys, yeah, the cool guys. Yeah. In fact, they took a they took a um, upright piano and wheeled it across the parking lot. I don't know where they got it from, like a conference room or something yeah. like that, and stuck it in one of their rooms. Yeah. So they would have, like, there were musicians there. They would play. I think Bruce McGill played the piano, and, and it was, like, always this amazing fucking party going on that I was never invited to. Yeah. And so this waitress uh, says to me one night, listen, um, y- you should know that the FBI is watching uh, the the cast and yeah. the company and the hotel, and this entire shoot. 
and they know all about you know the drugs and they know all about everything that's going on and they're you should just know that you know she had the i don't know why how, the, yeah, right. I don't know how she knows about the fbi <laughs> but, but i was you know at that moment high enough to be like super paranoid right so <laughs> i thought that a good way in would be uh to tell these guys yeah. that was going on, right. that, that, that that I would be sort of like a hero, yeah. you know, right? Because then everybody would like turn the music down or or whatever, just sure. be cool, you know yeah, what I yeah. mean? So I called up, and they're having a party down yeah. there, and and I called up. I think it was Bruce McGill's room, and I'm like, uh, hey, listen, uh, it's it's Kevin, uh, Kev, Kevin Bacon. I'm the guy that plays it, you know, yeah. yeah. And <laughs> listen. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the FBI, I just want you to know, cause I, I have a pretty good authority that the FBI has been in town and they're like watching everything and watching you guys and watching the hotel. And the, I heard the music going on in the background. He's like, fuck you! <laughs> Slams the phone down. <laughs> <laughs> that was Nothing it. ever happened. No, that was Nothing it. ever happened. You, you didn't get the confirmation or anything. The way no. she just had some inside info. No. So that movie was huge. And then what happens after that? I didn't work for a really, I didn't, I went back to waiting tables. Oh my uh, God. Yeah. I went back to waiting tables and, and I've told the story before, but I had to ask for the night off to go to the premiere of Animal House. I had that night off from the restaurant. My, my boss said, yeah, sure. It's, you know, it's your big premiere. Right. Yeah. There you go. go and, ahead, but make sure you be back tomorrow. Yeah. Exactly. Well, exactly. Right. Yeah. And it was really, really, uh, terrible because, um, I got down there. I took the subway down to the to Times Square, wherever the theater yeah. was, and there was a red rope. But uh, I was on the other side of the red rope, and I saw the cast all arriving. So like they had a tier, I guess, of kind of tickets, and yeah. and you know, and those guys. I look, of course, I mean, I just had a small part, you know, but right. but they were like the, the Animal House, and yeah. like you know, the, the, the guys. And uh, so. Like, here I am at my big Hollywood premiere, and I'm, like, watching it sort of, like, from a distance, and I, I get down to the seats, and, and I don't have the right seat to get past the, you know, the, the line where yeah. the good seats are. Then I get down to the party, which was down at the Village Gate, and and uh, I didn't have the ticket to get into the VIP, th you know, and... So they were still icing you, the cool yeah, they kids. Were, yeah, they were, the cool kids were icing me, exactly. <laughs> and I had this idea that because I was in the movie, I was going to be beating women off with a stick sure because everyone would recognize me and, and yeah and, you know it was now the asshole that all the women want to be with exactly. right exactly they that, don't that want guy. yeah they so didn't want <laughs> to be with me nor did they, i remember talking to a, a a girl and trying to convince her that i was actually even in the movie yeah and i got so depressed that i went back to the restaurant and just hung out with my friends um at the at, at the the all state cafe what a sad premiere story isn't that just tragic. And then Levinson cast you. Like, did you go back to soap operas and shit? Or I what? did. Yeah. Then I went. On, when I went on the soaps. Yeah, I was on the Search for Tomorrow and the Guiding Light. No, not Search for Tomorrow. Uh, yeah, Search for Tomorrow. Yeah, and uh, the Guiding Light. And I was doing theater. And um, but you were working. And all that stuff adds up, right? It all adds up. I, I mean, doing oh, soap yeah. operas, whatever that's like. No, no, kinda... no. Great. Uh, believe me, I, 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 I started working. Uh, yeah. Pr pretty quick i mean relatively quick i mean i'd you know sometimes i would run out of money so i'd have to go back to waiting tables and i had a boss that was like really like cool about that and probably th i'd say three times i said ah, i'm done <laughs> yeah this is it yeah. yeah yeah and then uh and then i'd have to go back because i remember like when i saw like diner was a huge movie for me so, and I'm assuming I'm so a, glad. A huge, nice. Yeah, I, I'm assuming it was a huge movie for you. It was a huge movie and amazing, amazing memories, you know, of making something. I mean, sometimes we'll get together, like, uh, I'll see one of the guys, you know, Riser I still see, or I'll, you know, run into uh, Danny or, yeah. or Timmy or whatever. And we have had these, at times, these kind of, uh, you know, almost kind of like reunions with Barry and stuff, Barry Levinson. And... uh all the like there's more stories for us packed into that seven week shoot or whatever it was than than you know a hundred other movies it really was, it was just a it was just an like a really fun fun intense and uh interesting kind of time for all of us i think 
in in the sense that you were all young actors and and this was like uh was it a loose environment in the in that you all really got to know each other and you had the uh and you were all sort of hungry and excited or? yes yes and and none of us were some we some of us had been working yeah. uh but none of us were stars except i would say maybe for mickey who was just kind of like exploding based on the Thing that he had done in body heat he had this, oh the the bomb guy yeah yeah but we were uh in this hotel in baltimore um just guys single guys yeah. hanging out and and what was interesting was that when if you if you look at the movie it's almost kind of random like who happens to be together at any given time sometimes there's three guys together yeah. sometimes there's two sometimes you know what i mean yeah. you don't it's kind of not all that well planned out in terms of that. <laughs> yeah. But the guys that were together would be hanging out on the set. Right. Together, having a f- fun time. Yeah. And the guys that weren't at work that day would go and hang out and do something else. So there was this kind of like thing where uh, all of our different relationships were all sort of... Um, uh, we're Genuine? All kind of- yeah, and they all sort of bounced off each other in interesting ways. And it was also a deal where Barry Levinson did kind of the same thing about um, bringing us down there early for what he called rehearsal, but it was really just a bonding kind of session. Yeah, it seemed like there was a lot of authentic sort of, you know, interaction. Like he was able to honor each of your personalities. There was. Within the character. Like it really, like that was the first time I was like, when I saw Paul Reiser, I thought he was hilarious. And I had hilarious. not really seen him do comedy. And I knew him, like, from that movie. Mm-hmm. And when I was in college, I don't remember when that movie came out. Uh, so I, I, it was my first year of college. And I, and I saw that. And I, and I thought he was hilarious and all you guys were great. But then I went to the comic strip and he was there just sitting there. And that's when I asked him, I said, I want to do comedy. How do I do it? No kidding. Yeah. Uh-huh. Because of Diner. And he was like, I don't know, you just do it. Like, Great. <laughs> That's what I tell people. It's like, you know, spend your life afraid, just get it out of your system, see if you like it. Yeah. Well, Riser was amazing because he didn't really, on paper, have much of a part. Like, right. Like, when we auditioned for Diner, you would go in and pick one of the parts to read. I wanted to either play uh, Boogie, because he was cool, the part that Mickey played. Yeah. Or the part that Tim Daly played because he was romantic. So I right. was like, either I want to be cool or I want to get the girl. I read both of those. Barry went, eh, why don't you read Fenwick? I was like, Fenwick, uh, I don't know, Fenwick. There's not, is there anything there? I, no, I didn't say that, but I, I was disappointed, frankly, that I had gotten Fenwick because I thought the other parts were better and, and flashier and, and more interesting. And he was such a reactive kind of character. But when Riser got down there, he almost had no part. Yeah. And all of a sudden, we would get into these, like, <laughs> rehearsal situations, yeah. and he just fucking starts improvising, and Barry's like, that's so funny, I love that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not comfortable great. with the word nuance. I'm not, yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. Or, you know, are you going to eat that, or yeah, whatever. Right. Because he's brilliant with yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And now I still see this guy's, like, part start to get bigger and bigger and bigger. I'm like, this fucking guy, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, Riser's eating, <laughs> eating the movie. <laughs> he's eating the movie. Well, you know, I, I, I... I made a choice when I realized that um, I didn't consider myself as a good improviser. Right. And I was Im- uh, intimidated by Paul's skill, but even by um, by all of them. You know what I mean? Uh, they were all really good at that. Um, Danny and Timmy Steve. and Mickey and Steve. Steve, you know, would just kind of say crazy shit and it was just fucking funny and Barry would love it. So, so I was very intimidated by that and I literally made a choice that I needed to not be the guy that comes up with the funny thing to say. That I'm the guy that sits there and reacts yeah. to what everybody else is saying. An important laughs. part. Yeah, because yeah. in any kind of dynamic, you know, if you have a bunch of friends that, you know, uh, hang out. Yeah. There's always one guy that's like the wise ass and, you know, there's other yeah. guys that just sit there and laugh. Sure. Or, you know what, you know what I mean? So, so that was kind of like what I, uh, what, what, what I chose. And I think that ultimately it, 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 it worked out better. Well, yeah. But in, in your character is really out of all of them, the most troubled character. He is. He's a mess. What did you make decisions about your career at that point? Cause you never stopped working, but what were some of the challenges of being Kevin Bacon? 
at that point as an actor? There were a lot of challenges, um, both professionally and personally, because I was had a real difficult time with um, the uh, you know the kind of pop star aspect of it. The, of the, Footloose, yeah, of that re- of that right. super super kind of like. Uh, you know, pop star. The kids loved it. Yeah, and it's exactly what I didn't want to be. I, I so desperately, from the time I first set foot, even before I got to New York, yeah. wanted to be a serious actor, whatever the hell that means. That's like what I wanted to do. I wanted to do theater. I, you know, I wanted to be... De Niro, you know, or De Niro, or yeah. Meryl Streep, yeah. and Dustin, and yeah. you know, John Voight, you know, like, 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 you know, respected, yeah, work, you know, work with Cassavetes, you yeah, know, what yeah, I mean, like this, sure. this is this, this was the stuff, or, or theater, or you yeah, know, Kevin Klein, you know, yeah, and now I was a pop star, and Almost, so, it's, it's like one, one, it's like the next level, uh, it's just above child actor, exactly, right, exactly, and a- everything that I had done up to that point was sort of nobody knew it you know what i right. mean you 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 th- doing an off off broadway play is sure. you feel that it's just as important right but nobody fucking knows it, right you know right. so it doesn't yeah. really yeah. Ma- we made a difference tonight yeah ex- for those 12 people for those 12 people <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> um and and so i was i had a hard time um i was very resistant of it and yeah. again if I had been open to people giving me advice, I would have. People would have said, "Look, embrace it, take it as far as you can take it, and then just do good work." You know what I mean? Right, right. Just, just, and and don't and make take your time with the choices that you're going to make. But, but s- you, use the 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 sort of star turn capital. Yeah, yeah, Which, yeah. But what did you choose to do? I just made bad movies. <laughs> you know. I just made bad choices, you know, and and sometimes Out of stubbornness. Oh God, I don't know. I feel like it was self sabotage. Mm. I think it was a. Uh, I think I think I, and again, yeah. Look, you know, I don't have much of a rearview mirror when I think about these things because I like to look down the road and 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 stay moving right. forward. Yeah. And I also feel like again. The process by which you get wherever you get yeah. is the right process for has you. To be. It has, has to be. be. You yeah. can't go back and change time. Right. And 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 so I learned a lot, yeah. you know, from that, from making bad choices. And I and then I was able to, you know, kind of turn things back around. So so, you know, I, it was the right thing for me to go through. You know, oh, the big picture. That was a sweet movie. That was a good choice. Yeah, nobody saw it. Um, so, like, I, I like the movie. I think it's great. I love Chris Guest. I had a blast making it. You know, Chris Guest, I mean, has an, an unbelievable uh, ability to take something that is really, really true and really, really familiar yeah. and make it hilarious. And, you know, y- when you see some of the characters... Like the studio executives, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Right. Uh, and Marty Short is my agent, yeah, yeah, you know, and you go, can these pe- like, did these people actually exist in Hollywood? And then you meet them, <laughs> and then they're like, it's like exactly the same. I mean, there's things in that movie that we, yeah. my wife and I, still use to this day. I mean, Marty Short has a great line where <laughs> he says, they're having he's having the first meeting with him, and he goes. Nick, I don't know you. I don't know your work, but I think you're very talented. <laughs> and it's like, to me, that's like, you get that shit all the time. Yeah. You know, killing you with kindness. Yeah. Well, it's funny because that's, that was a big sort of shift, like in, I uh, imagine, guests, you know, kind of vision, like, because he went the whole, in completely improvisational direction. I mean, that was a pretty tight movie. Right. And that was written. Right. He went straight to mockumentaries. But yeah. After, which after are, Spinal Tap. Which yeah. are, you know, yeah. he and Although he, Spinal Tap, I think he did right before the big picture. And but that was, he was acting in that, right, really, exactly right? That, right? But then, like, right. his whole oeuvre is now these weird kind of, like, improvi- improvised right. masterpieces one, with one Eugene Levy. So brilliant. So then you do, like, JFK and, and Few Good Men, Power Pack. That was a good punch. Good one-two punch. Well, you had a couple movies in between there. I'm sorry I'm doing this, but, like, you've done so much. I have to. <laughs> That's all right. But, like, I thought A Few Good Men, like, was... Uh, that was a fucking astounding performance. Well, you know what? I thank you for that. Um, Should have won an Oscar, buddy. Oh, thank you. Yeah. You got I, a chip on your shoulder about that? About the Oscars? Yeah. I think that to say <laughs> to say that um, 
That's a tough question, I'll tell you, to, to answer, because on one hand, if you say, I really don't care, right. then it's, you're, it's obviously bullshit, right. and it's, <laughs> and it's going to feel like false humility. Clearly, you're lying. Yeah. And if you say uh, you care a lot, then you just look like a bitter, yeah. you know, fucking asshole. And the thing I always remind myself is that, well, first off, um, of course I would like to even be nominated yeah. for anything, yeah. which doesn't really happen. You've, which, you've which, won some, have you? I, I, I got a couple of things here and there, but yeah. but of course, and yeah. and part of the reason is that uh, it opens up more opportunities, yeah. right? Because, for instance, there's a certain kind of movie that's made for a certain kind of budget that's going to come out in the fall. And when those people are putting those movies together, what they want to put on the poster yeah. is Oscar nominee, Oscar sure. nominee from this Oscar Ticker, nominee. Ticket TV. sellers. Yeah, it's like it's like a yeah, and it's 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 a selling of the tickets, but it's also positioning it in a way that's going to become an Oscar movie, and and especially in this day and age, mm -hmm. in order for something to break out as serious at all, it yeah. has to get awards consideration. Um, I think the so, best way to look at it is sort of like it's something I'd like to experience once in my life. I'd yeah. like to get one of those. There you ones. go. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Or you know, but the 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 truth is, is that um, when somebody comes up to you and says, "I loved," you know, when you say that was important to me, diner, for yeah. instance, you know, that's like uh, I I can really like I can put that on a, an imaginary um, sure shelf. Oh yeah. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Oh yeah, absolutely. The uh, impact you have on people. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was a life changing movie for me. Really. Right. Well, yeah. Good. Good. But so that that means something. That means more ultimately the impact you have on people that you don't even know. Like even this podcast, you, know, you get these emails from people like, "Thank God," and I'm like, "Well, that's gr that you know that's what you do it for." No, I know. I've heard you read some of them. It's, it's very touching, actually. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. No, it really. I is. get them all the time, man. No, yeah. it's, it's I, I cry here. I sit here and cry yeah. reading my emails. No, it's really it's it's really it's very touching. Yeah, and but the but that movie was sort of. That part was so controlled. And so, like, there's a moment in that movie where, like, when you make choices like that, because whatever you made, decisions you made about your acting career, you've had a very varied career. And these characters are very different. And even the ones that seem similar are incredibly different. Like, the humility of that guy, of that Marine, was he a Marine? The Marine yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Where, you know, he knew that moment where that moment happens, where, you know, Nicholson does that, and you're in that position, that moment where you got to be like, you know exactly what happens next. Mm. This guy doesn't go home. Right, right. And he doesn't seem to know that. Yeah. And yeah. then, you know, that moment with Cruz, I mean, that was a, a, somehow or another, there was a lot of humanity in that thing. That was a great run uh, at that point, and I'll tell you why, because the first part of that was JFK. Right. And then Murder in the First and a few good men and the river wild and what was good about that was that i was a character actor and i realized that that's really what i was you know what i mean yeah yeah because after yeah. footloose i was sort of trying to get into this whatever it's called leading man kind of box right and and even back that in the in the 80s there was more of an instinct in our our industry to make somebody into a leading man or make them into a character actor. but then there's only like nine of those guys right so exactly. You, right. Exactly. And I wasn't one of them ultimately. And, and you really, you had that moment of realization? Yeah. Well, yeah. I had a, it's, you know, we talk about, um, leaving yourself open to, um, advice. Yeah. I had an agent, uh, who said to me, this is what we need to do. And you need to get back to this. And you need to stop focusing on, uh, the size of the part and all that other shit. Yeah. You know, and, and she sent me to meet Oliver Stone and I did JFK. And that literally like spun things, both like in terms of perception, but also in my mind. The thing is, is that and you were able to use that research from Fifty uh, Third Street. Exactly, <laughs> I was. Well, I did some even crazier research for that. That's a whole other thing. Oh my gosh. What? Uh, well, you know, the ga the guy that I was playing was based on a real guy, and he was a fascist sort of gay. Uh, well, I guess he was gay. Yeah. Um, but really into um, like leather and I don't even want to, you know, certain kind of like really hardcore kind of sexual yeah. stuff. 
And Oliver Stone wanted me to spend hang out with the guy. So I did. I spent like the night. Oh, he's still alive. He was alive when we made the movie yeah. off. He's still alive. Spent the night running around to all these um leather bars in in uh in New Orleans. And uh I was like, fuck. And it was actually the <laughs> night it was night of the cast dinner, which was like I was like, Jesus, thanks, Oliver. You know, he, yeah. he, he sends me a but uh, Gary Oldman was in the movie. Yeah, and uh, he was Oswald, right? Uh, yeah, and Gary, yeah, and Gary, and and uh, I call, I call Gary. I'm like, dude, can you can you do this? Can you do this run with me? <laughs> He's like, okay. <laughs> and uh, so he, so so it was so sweet of him. So he, so me and Gary ran around with this 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 <laughs> lunatic. Yeah, throughout. Anyway, uh, that that was a amazing uh evening. Yeah. And, Saw a lot of stuff, learned some things. Learned some things, yeah. <laughs> but you know what? When I became, when I wanted to be an actor, it was never, it was always about wanting to put on a different hat every time, you know, wanting to, you know, f to be a different guy. Like, yeah. to me, that's what being an actor was. I right. mean, when I look at Meryl Streep, you know, right. she, she's like the best at that because when you line them all up, it's, you know, some of us have tried that. But then the most successful ones are kind of right in the same pocket. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, right. When I look at her, I go, okay, uh, I totally believed her as this one. I totally believed her as this one. And they don't, they, like in terms of like like the social uh, uh, upbringing or, 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 you know, whatever, those two people couldn't be any more yeah, different. it's kind of fascinating, like that. You don't see the uh, you, you, you don't see the technique, right? And right. you're like, sort of like, what the fuck? Yeah, yeah. So that's the type of. Thing I think that, I think you do that definitely. Well, and I think you're afforded that as a character actor. What I what I do appreciate if I if I was to get, um, you know, like I said, I have a lot of gratitude about. Um, being able to make a living at all as an actor or as any kind of an artist um you, you know you know as well as i do that it, that is a uh, that's a real uh struggle the thing that i really appreciate is that when i get offered things um they're pretty varied yeah. like not in terms of like the kind of characters that come my way they're varied not only in terms of the, the men but also uh the genre you know um things come that are you know funny and things come that are dark and things come that are intense and weird and you know man you have like there's some moments of the uh, weird humanity that like because i'm flashing back on some moments of of your roles like i don't remember the the jfk role clearly but i certainly remember that moment in uh, a few good men and i remember the moment in Sleepers. <laughs> no, but it's the weird moment that I remember is w when he finds you after. When you're just this fucking drunk, Thank fucking you. nothing. Thank you for that. And I, I really appreciate that. Do you man. know what I mean? Like, and, and you just see in your eye that it's, you know, you're just completely morally bankrupt and done. And, and you know, and that's when, that was the fucking moment. Not the moment where you're fucking doing horrible things to right. kids. Right. But where, like, the, the humanity of that moment is like, you know, what's going to happen now to that guy? Because there's a, there, you have a moment of, of not empathy, but like, that guy looks like he did himself in. Yeah, he's a little man. He's, right. Yeah, he's a little man. And he gets seven in the chest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you kind of, you're okay with that though. Oh, I mean, yeah. yeah I mean, People that, thought, but when, when, yeah, I love it. You know, if I, if I play a character like that and you go to, go to the movies and people cheer after he gets blown away, you <laughs> yeah. know, you've done a good job, you know. What, that movie but, I thought was so good. And I remember at the time there were some issues with, I don't know what people's issues were with it, but you know, cause the book was so fucking brutal, but I thought the movie was good. That was Barry Levinson. It was, mm -hmm. and and it's so you work with him again, but like and again again about you know four friends in a much more horrible circumstance. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you know what's really weird is like some movies really don't do as well as they should because they're they have horrible endings, like yeah, or you tragic. Think, maybe that's yeah. Well, look, I mean, I always say that um, the last you know five minutes, first off, can take kind of a mediocre movie and make people have a really good feeling yeah, yeah. about it. I, or, well, I remember that movie, but yeah. it was heavy, dude. Yeah. But the, it, like, in Apollo 13, another, like that, another, you're real good with groups of guys. Like, mm. <laughs> in some weird way, uh -huh, right? Uh huh. 
Paxton was in here like a week before he passed. Was he? Oh, Jesus. It was, so, so, it was oh. so good that he was here and so sad what happened. But so God sad. damn it. I'm glad I had that time with him. Yeah, yeah. He's a, he's a great dude. He's oh, my really, God. Really fun. So much enthusiasm and oh uh, yeah n- yeah and always delivers man you know he gets on the screen and it's sort of like you uh, know hell yeah hell but yeah. that that must have been a great that we love had, that fucking movie we had an amazing time i oh mean my we God. and some of my fondest memories of any kind of shooting were um well i'm sure i don't know if you ever did he talk to you about the kc-135 the vomit comet no okay well <laughs> those are two it's two, two things first off <laughs> we a lot of when we're when we were in the in the first the initial um launch yeah. in, the, in the capsule some of that we did um on a sound stage uh-huh. and it was we would get strapped in because we were in our you know it's giant spacesuits and we couldn't really move too much for a really long time yeah but we had communication between um Tom and Bill and Ron and I um and we could sort of like hear each other and we would hear each other just for like Two three hours just in, in between shots while they're setting up. Yeah, I don't think I've ever laughed as long or as hard. And I wish I could. Rem- I wish somebody had fucking recorded it because just you guys in space. Because Bill is hilarious, yeah. and and Tom is hilarious, <laughs> and Ron's like kind of like little reactions to us. I mean, we had such a blast. But there's a there's a um, Back then, in order to uh, create weightlessness, yeah. you would need harnesses and straps, and then you would try to paint those things out. And it was pretty um, rudimentary. And these days, no problem. You know, I just saw life. You know, they're floating through the whole movie, sure. and, and it's you know, it's all kind of digital stuff. There's a plane called the KC-135, also known as a vomit comet that NASA has, where they that they use to train astronauts and to create weightlessness on on Earth, which is impossible. People, right. people think there's such a thing as an anti-gravity chamber. There's no such thing. Right. What the plane does is it goes out of the Gulf of Mexico, and it climbs straight up. It's like a big, big-ass plane, like a, 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 I don't know if it's a 707 or yeah, something yeah. like that. Climbs straight up and then dives and straight up and dives, and they're called parabolas. Yeah. And when you go over the top, the combination of centrifugal force uh, throwing you back up, you know, like a roller coaster, and the gravitational pull balance out for 25 seconds. Yeah. And so we had to go up there to experience that. Yeah. (laughs) And, you know, I'm like, this is terrifying and nauseating. They call it the vomit Yeah, yeah. Um, And... We go and we do it and we, you know, do, you do like, uh, I think you do 20 out and 20 back and then, you know, we came down, we landed. It was so fun. Well, we experienced weightlessness. That's so cool. And, you know, high fiving and the whole thing and we're kissing the ground. Uh, Ron has a conversation with Steven Spielberg who says to him, uh, why don't you shoot the movie up there? And then you'll have actual weightlessness. Just build the set. And shoot it up there. And he comes back to us. He's like, guys, guys, I got a great, 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 exciting. Um, uh, I'm like, oh, fuck. You're kidding me. And we go out down to Houston and uh, shot quite a lot of stuff at, at, in an in a, in a, in a airplane hurtling up and down and up and down. 600 times we did it. Oh, my God. And, so and, you got used to it. Well, we, Well, yeah. I mean... And so, twenty five I mean, seconds at a time. Yeah, yeah. So twenty five seconds at a time. But but you know that's a fairly long time to get a shot. Then you get another one, and and um, you're uh, you know the camera's floating, so so it can all be kind of like handheld. Yeah. But it's like you know literally like um, you know bite the water out of the air thing. And, yeah. And uh, we would. If we weren't in the scene, we'd play in the back of the airplane, play football, and like I mean, you could fly like Peter Pan. I mean, up and down. So, as I was speaking of Paxton, you know, as a as a bonding sort of experience, yeah. that was amazing. And and Bill and Tom were way more gung ho than me. I'm like, I got a family, you know, because it's you know it's terrifying. And and uh, and we also had to take some very very serious drugs to combat the nausea. Um, so we were all a little bit like kind of. 
you know, druggy in a weird yeah. sort of way. But anyway, <laughs> it was it was great. We had such a blast, and and he was so gung ho. Man, this is the greatest! I can't believe it. I, I mean, I just you you could not be in a bad mood around that guy on the set, <laughs> yeah. you know, because yeah. he was so enthusiastic about the process of of um making movies yeah you yeah. know he and loved it he loved it yeah i just watched mystic river it's one of those movies if it's on i'm gonna watch it from wherever it's on and i like doing that I, mm. i'd rather than you know uh choose a movie to watch flip around and go like oh shit mm. the good part's coming mm. but like those those scenes with you again this vulnerability that you're able to offer up on the those bits on the phone mm. but that moment Look at me, I'm like that idiot. That moment where where you say to Sean Penn, what'd you do? Huh. That was like, oh my God. And the fact is, you like, you know, I, well, I'll ask you this because I just noticed it the last time. Is that, you know, you know him, you know Sean Penn's character, you guys come up in the same area and you, and you knew what he did. And, you know, and he knew what he did. And then there was the, the morality of the, the script is that, well, he did kill somebody. But, you know, but in, in that movie, I don't know how the book is written or how you thought of it. Are you going to get Sean Penn? <laughs> because I pick out, I take my finger and I make it into a gun. And, you, and I you point pull it the trigger. It. Yeah, we're at the, uh, we're at the parade. I'll tell you an interesting thing about that. I went to Clint and uh, I'm sure you've heard this before, but, but Clint is not somebody who wants to, uh, talk too much about yeah motivation and those types oh, really? of things no he he really does he 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 wants you to go home go into your room do whatever you need to do and come to work with your shit i heard that about like that's an interesting thing that i'm learning from i just talked to walter hill mm -hmm. and he said that this whole idea of directors directing actors right. is a kind of a myth it's a, right. it, and he said it's sort of like they do a job you hire them to do the job. Right. You chose them for the job they do, right. so do your job. Exactly. Yeah. And horrible name dropping here, but Meryl Streep said to me when we were doing uh, The River Wild, she said, you have to work with Clint. You're going to love it because you like to work in that way where you figured it out. And Meryl's like that. I mean, she, you know... She, I mean, she would take direction, certainly, right. but like when she comes to work, it's not like she's discovering right. the character. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? You yeah. Know, made choices. And Clint's very much like that. Yeah. Um, and sometimes he'll only do one take. Sometimes he'll shoot the rehearsal. Uh, everything is very, very, you know, so all of a sudden, all of us went, oh, fuck, we got to get our shit together. Like, <laughs> the, the, like we're not, the, you know, it's not going to be 18 takes, right. you know, whatever. So we actually started to kind of like, rehearse on our own and and uh it was you and sean and, and me and sean and tim and 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 fish you know we we would get together and read through the script and stuff and he, clint was never there you know mm -hmm. um and so when so so rarely did i ask him right because i knew that wasn't his yeah. thing you know? yeah but at that moment i said so clint um what what is that that i'm doing there it was in the script too. It was in the script, yeah. To to take to take that. Yeah. It might have even been in the book. I, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and he said, "Well, that's for the audience to decide." Mm. And so I said, "Okay, I'm going to make a choice, but I'm going to take that to my grave because." If he wanted it to be for the audience to decide, that I'm going to, you know, honor that. I know what it was. Okay, <laughs> you're going to get him. <laughs> okay. Oh! <laughs> Actor secrets are sort of for me. They, like I've had this happen once before. I'm like, what? Do you, what do you got to lose by telling us now? It's the only. It's the only moment that I've ever done that I that I will hold on to. But look, I think that I think that's a very astute observation. <laughs> well, it's so weird that like I bring it up to you and I have this opportunity to talk to you because. You know, after seeing that movie like six or seven times, really, uh, in bits and pieces and a few times uh, all the way through, that uh, that struck me. And that was mm. like just a week or so ago. It mm. was on cable. And I was like, oh, I didn't, you know what I mean? Like, I didn't know what, what is the real bond ultimately that these guys really have? Yeah, well, you know, that's the thing is that could be interpreted as, um, you know, listen, you know me, I know you. We're cool. No, no, I didn't you see know. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. And like when you work with Merle or Sean or like y you know, it, y are you guys like do you do you find yourself 
like ever gleaning things like do, or are you set in your ways do you do you or at least res- do, when you work with uh, an actor do you do a scene and go like wow fucking sean nailed that or do you know oh sure yeah 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 i mean definitely i mean i think that you try uh as much as possible not to step outside and start watching right. what you're doing because you really have to be listening you gotta to the fight person that sometimes that, don't you yeah you do you yeah. do sometimes have to fight it but you really feel like you have to you know, I, I, especially even as I get, you know, older, I mean, it's like I really want to experience staying just kind of in it, you know, At like like the difference between the time when uh, you, you're waiting to go on to the time when they say action. In a way, I, I'm trying to learn how to make that sort of flow into one thing. And to really feel like I'm walking in this person's shoes, not pretending to be the guy. Like I don't make people call me by the character name right. and stuff like that. But I want to feel like I'm walking in another man's shoes at, at this time. So to actually stop and step out, either and look at my own work or look at the work of the person that I'm that I'm working with, yeah, um, is kind of c- counterproductive. That being said, you da- I don't I don't look at uh, you know. Jack Nicholson saying you can't handle the truth. Uh, you know, I'm going. Oh, fuck this guy's nailing this. Oh my god, is this good? You know, I can't. I, I'm, look, I mean, I can't. You know, of course I'm gonna. Of course I'm gonna see that. Even when he doesn't have to do the other side because they're doing a single, he'll do it. Like I don't know if you had that experience with he him. He did it again. And right again. It was one of the most. Uh, but I, I, I have so much respect for him. What was funny about it was that if you think about. That particular scene in A Few Good Men. I mean, shooting a courtroom is, there's a lot of coverage that you yeah. have to get because you got to get, first you got to get Jack, and then yeah. obviously, you know, they shot his side of things out right. first, you know, maybe three, four sizes on, on him. Amazing. You know, he's going to be off camera for the rest of the day. Now you're turning back around on Tom and to me and, and me and yeah. Kevin Pollock, and you know, it's like you got, there's a lot of pieces that yeah. you got to get. He just kept doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it. And for every single one of us, it was just as cool. And as, but, but what changed was that, you know, those Marine uniforms are just really uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, they make them so that you're not comfortable in them. Right. You know, they're made yeah. to, you know, feel like shit. I mean, he starts taking his jacket off, then his, you know, he's got his tie off, and, and then his hair starts getting all, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> by the like, end of the day, by the end of the day, he's still doing it, but he's like this, you know, kind of like he's more Nicholson than he is, you know. Right, right. You know, he's comfortable. Yeah, it was great. Okay, so let's talk about uh, I Love Dick, because, you know, I know Jill and, mm-hmm. and Catherine I love, and I, I think I'm going to get to talk to Griffin. I've met him once or twice. He's great. But, yeah, he is great. It, that, he's doing a, a good job in that. It's amazing. Yeah, i got to watch the rest of them. Yeah, please do. No, it, I will. Because it gets very, it gets, oh, boy, it really goes all kinds of pretty pretty interesting places. But like I said, being with an artist who's in that level of art, you know, like who, you know, who sells painting, she does well for herself mm. and 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 getting to know that community a little bit but still feeling outside of it. It's a very insulated odd world. Yes. Which is really great for a, a TV sh- for a show mm-hmm. because it 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 almost it doesn't seem fictional at all, but it's definitely outside of almost everyone's experience. Mm. So what was the pitch for you? How did you get involved with it? Um I got... Because you're Dick. I'm Dick. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I got a call that Jill Soloway had a had a, had a a new show, and uh, it was called I Love Dick, and that I was Dick. I mentioned it to my wife, and she said, so you're doing that one? I was like, well, honey, I haven't read the script yet. She's like, oh, no, 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 you're doing it. It's Soloway, <laughs> and Catherine was attached already. She's great. Yeah, she's, she's amazing. Oh, my God. She's amazing. Yeah. Uh, and... And then I spoke to a couple other women that in my life, my, my, maybe my daughter, one of my sisters, whatever. They're they're all saying the same thing. You're doing that one, dude. And then I read the script. I loved it. Yeah. Um, and Jill and I got on the Skype, and uh, she was in L.A. I was on the East Coast, and um, we spoke about it. And you know, it was important to her. Um, I think at this. point, point or maybe always i don't know i didn't haven't known her before this but but um the notion of having a good person somebody that um was going to be um a positive kind of influence and a positive vibe on the set was like yeah. really super important to her yeah 
you know, she's kind of like, I, I hear you're nice, but I don't, you know, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and what was important to me was to know whether or not this character was just going to be objectified or which was, which is cool, but whether you were ever going to get to know him and get a little bit deeper into who, who he is. And, um, she promised me that you would. And, uh, then we sort of began the, began the process. And, 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 and I feel like, especially in the, in the, the last few episodes, they kind of delivered on that promise. Well, the book was sort of controversial in that community. Mm -hmm. From what I understand that, uh, you know, I don't think I'm speaking out of school really, but I mean, it's a, it's based on a, on a real book by this Chris Krause person yes. yeah. who went on this, uh, this thing, this, uh, what do you call them? The, what is that situation there? Uh, an, a residence, artist yeah. residence mm -hmm. in Marfa, which is now like sort of, uh, the capital of, uh, of art. Have you been and, there? No, I haven't been there yet. Yeah. That's cool. You should go. I, I, well, I'll go. I, I, we're going to go. I, yeah. I, I'll check it out. Yeah, but but, it out. but it, it's really a kind of the sort of the idea that this woman who in the in the in the show is is not an artist per se and becomes immediately obsessed with you and then you know starts to present her this art project as this you know these documents these letters of obsession and things that um and you don't you, you know from the point on that is that you th there's a moment there where you're like this this person's crazy or this is sure. you, you know and that like it your your character is just holding strong to this onslaught of obsessive you know insecurity and and need and and, and it, it's like uh did you talk to the real dick no no i i don't think he would want to talk to me um he was not happy about the book the book is written sort of as a semi, I mean, they, it really is a memoir, but, but it's kind of presented almost like a novel, I think. Yeah. I, but, um, no, I didn't. And, uh, in the book, you very, you learn very little about, about him. And it's more and about her. It's really more about her and, and, and about Silvera, about her husband. And, and what I really wanted to do was make sure that I could create a character that had some more kind of depth and interest. And, and one of the th people that I latched onto, see the book, the book actually takes place in, um, uh, like Northern California. Yeah. Um, had Marfa had nothing to do with it. Marfa, yeah. Marfa, Texas, but Marfa, Texas was, um, there was a, there's a character there named Donald Judd. Uh -huh. who was a famous sculptor uh -huh. um, living in New York who had driven through Marfa, Texas when he was a young man on his in the army and remembered it. And he left New York and went to Marfa, Texas and started buying up buildings and ranches. He was and, the guy. And he was the guy. Yeah. And he's very, very, I would say, probably a lot more similar to Dick than to uh to the dick in the book right and and one of the things that i really wanted to explore with this was the nature of celebrity mm -hmm. because dick um is a very big fish in a very small pond yeah and he has donald judd for instance was a was a successful sculpt sculptor in, in new york but maybe wasn't the most famous sculptor in new york yeah of course and went to this tiny, tiny little town in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's West Texas. It takes three hours to get there from El Paso. That's the closest, you know, airport. Really? really? Yeah, it's very hard to get to. Yeah. Um, and he created a, a world where he was a king. Yeah. He was, you, 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 everybody knew him. Everybody knew, knows every move and everything he does. Right. And that to me is a lot like what, being an actor is kind of like yeah. you, you try to create a world where you are 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 the subject of of attention and of of focus, and then once you've created that, you sometimes have a difficult relationship with that notion, right? And that's what is going on oh, for so this guy. From the beginning, that's where you were going. That's the work you did. Th that those are the choices you're making yes. based on that dynamic within yourself. Yes. And, yeah. And this and 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 you know, women um, 
throw themselves at Dick, and 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 this woman uh, is no exception, you know. And I think that when you when we were kind of talking about this before, but um, you know, when when you when people hang on every word, admire you, tell you that they love you and they love your work and and all those kinds of things. On one hand, it's like amazingly great and it makes you feel so good all the yeah, time. Right. But on the other hand, you're always kind of struggling going, maybe, uh, uh, do, is any of this deserved? Yeah, right? you don't know me. Y- yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, or, yeah. Or have I done anything that really is any good? And, right. You know, uh, I don't know if you probably, um, maybe not gotten there, but they, I mean, they talk about in the, in the, in the, in the show that I haven't made any art in seven years. And that, um, oh yeah, was that, there was that one yelling. I think when she yells at you, you haven't yeah. done anything in that, yeah. when she shows up to audit the class. Right, right. She's done all her homework. Yeah, you haven't made anything, you know. So, so, and, and so I think that's where he's at in his life is that he's kind of, he's struggling with this, this, um, undeserved celebrity. And then you do make something, you retitle the bricks yes. piece. Yes. <laughs> I love that beat. That's funny, man. That I, was a funny beat. I make it with a, I, I, yeah, yeah with a pen. Yeah. Well, I well, well. Now I'm excited to watch the the other uh, the rest of it, and uh, I think it I think it's a great world. I think it's a, a you know I didn't know how I was going to feel about it, but the weird menace of you know you're at this point where I'm, I am in the series, you're still pretty detached. But whatever's going on with Griffin and Catherine and that unraveling, and then these other surrounding artists, that one scene where they they try to rehearse that play, mm-hmm. it, it was like it's really hard not to make that stuff look. I don't know if trite's the right, right word or hackneyed, but you know, having been with an artist for a while now, it's like they live in a very specific space, yes. artists. Yes. And it's all very earnest and it's all very, you know, they are taking risks, but it, it just seems very insulated. And I, and I think that, you know, that to do that for a, a, a broader audience, it, there's some, you know, there's some uh, traps to that, but it yes. seems you, you, that you've avoided it. Well, I think that. I think that you make a really good point, um, but I also think that uh, w- even within trying to make it not look hackneyed, I think um, J- Jill is still is also willing to say maybe sometimes it is. Do you know what I mean? Oh no, absolutely. You know? Yeah, this, and, maybe and, it's okay if this looks ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, right. And, and I think that's very, that's a really fine line to walk. Plus, the other thing is that brilliantly they have chosen to uh intercut these kind of art films oh made, yeah they're great made by women these strange yeah, sort of yeah. like one of them had a profound impact on uh, my girlfriend like when she saw it she's like oh my god that i saw that at the show and oh the, she had already seen it the milk one. Oh, the milk oh that's crazy right yeah, it's I, great I, it's great yeah. it's great um i saw the whole one it goes on and on and on and yeah on. Uh, but anyway yeah um you know one of the things that's kind of cool is that I have a long uh, history besides like the mainstream movies that I've, you know, tried to make. I've always gone back to sort of like indie art house type, mm-hmm. type things <clears throat> because I feel like whatever, you know, you don't get paid and you're making movie art and, you know, it's harder and harder to get that kind of stuff done in films these days because there's, there's very little spot for it right you know what i mean yeah. and so you're really struggling you're struggling at uh, film festivals and you're struggling to make this kind of art but i love dick is like a is like an art house movie you know an art house you know sure. what i mean it's very experimental in and, the way that it's shot in the way that it's cut and the kind of music that it's even in the way that we we approached it from an acting standpoint so that was really kind of fun for me i was like this is fucking cool man this is like being back you know, yeah, doing some little crazy movie in the streets of New York. Right. Know? There's a a great um, director named Andrea Arnold who directed uh, two really stunning movies. If you haven't seen them, one is called Fish Tank and one is called American Honey. Uh, she's a British um, director that Jill really admired, and is, those are they're super like art house, you know, kind yeah. of movies. Brilliant, both of them. But she uh, directed four of our episodes, which we were thrilled to kind of have her. And I'll, I'll give you an example. One of the things that she does, which is fascinating to me, is that you'll do a take, do take, you know, a couple of takes, and then we'll do a silent take where we just take all the words out and we just sort of play the scene with physicality oh, wow. or a look or um, 
a, a you know a, a, just a feel just a feeling yeah i've never done that in my life as as, a, as an wow. actor and you know i've done a lot of shit yeah and i was like this is like mind blowing yeah it's what really really cool and how is she going to use it and you cut little pieces oh in. really and if you look at the show you'll see that there's just moments that are just kind of like Look at that! Look at her eye, just for a second there, or or just a hand on a on a leg uh -huh. or, or something. Right, right. You know, uh, they are sometimes from these silent. Oh, things. that's a, that's a trip. So that that's exciting, doing something new. Totally. And you're and it, well, that must be great at, at you know where you're at in your career to, to actually be like, all right, I've never done this before. Yeah, definitely. And and I was a little bit resistant to it, frankly, because. You know, I'm old and jaded and bitter, <laughs> you know, whatever. <laughs> and my wife just kept saying to me, just leave your heart open, you know, just, just leave yourself open to, you don't, you know, even at this level of experience, you don't know everything there is to know about acting and making movies and, 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 you know, the process. Yeah. So just leave, leave yourself open, you know, to a certain extent. No, it sounds like you got a good partner there. Oh yeah, yeah, she's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's no, she's she's smart. And you respect each other, uh, craft. We do. Yeah. Well, it was great talking to you, Kevin. I appreciate you taking the time. You too, man. It was really fun. All right, really enjoyed it. That was great. I love talking to Kevin Bacon. Solid dude. Good guy. Thanks again to Audible and their new show, Ponzi Supernova, the six-part Audible original series that sheds new light on Bernie Madoff and the biggest Ponzi scheme in history. Go listen for free on Audible or wherever you get podcasts.